All right, here we go. Good evening, everyone. We're calling to order the March 8th, 2021 Spokane City Council meeting to order. We'll start with a roll call. Council President Beggs. Present. Council Member Burke. Here. Council Member Cathcart. Present. Council Member Kinnear. Present. Council Member Stratton. I'm here. Council Member Wilkerson. Present. Let the record reflect that Council Member Mum is absent. All right, we have a fairly light legislative agenda this evening, but we have um, three proclamations and a salutation. And we also have a report from uh, the Peaceful Valley neighborhood. Uh, so we'll start out with the salutation uh, for Volunteers of America. Council Member Stratton is going to read that. And she will be joined by Raylan Barden. Thank you. I couldn't think of a better person to be joined with on this. So this is City of Spokane, whereas for 125 years, the Volunteers of America has provided high quality social services to millions of people, from homeless veterans to seniors and families in need to at-risk youth, men and women returning from prison and those recovering from addiction in 400 communities nationwide and has become one of the nation's largest and most comprehensive human services organizations. And whereas uh, Volunteers of America Eastern Washington and Northern Idaho has been serving the Spokane community since 1896, providing shelter and hope to those in need with no barrier access to services and has a rich 125 year history of empowering our vulnerable populations and actively engaging volunteers in the community. And whereas VOA Eastern Washington and Northern Idaho today runs 13 programs that have single adults in need, veterans, teenage expected mothers, and the women of our community with wraparound services because homelessness shouldn't be a life sentence. And where now, therefore, I, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby salute Volunteers of America Eastern Washington and North Idaho for their contribution to Spokane and commitment to hope, human dignity, and social justice. And I will turn it over to Raylynn. Ex except that I think Raylynn is not on the line. I'm sorry I misled you. She was going to be. But I believe we have a couple of other people. So maybe, is that Bridget? Cannon? Hi, yes, I'm here. Are you, are you here to accept this salutation for um, VOA? Uh, unexpectedly, yes. I will certainly accept okay. that salutation. <laughs> for Volunteers of America. Okay. I'm not sure where, where Raylan is. Um, she might be having difficulty connecting. Okay. Um, very proud to accept this, and thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank and, you. And Heather? Thank you. Heather, are you from Volunteers of America, too? No. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Great. Thank I you. See, I see that Fawn is here, who's our CEO. She has her hand raised. Oh, Fawn. Sorry. I'm not seeing you. So, yes. Von Schott, please say a few words for us. All right. And there's Ray Lynn as well. Okay. Ray Lynn or Fawn, whoever wants to go. You're both muted right now. Can you hear me now? Yes, Ray Lynn. Good to hear from you. Well, uh, sorry for the delay. Thank you so much for the proclamation and we're very excited to be celebrating 125 years of the community and be sure to check out our clock tower lighting this month at Roseland Park. Okay. All right. Well, great. Well, thanks for your partnership with the city of Spokane on so many important endeavors. And thank you, Fawn, for you and your leadership and your team. And now I'd like to turn to, um, 
uh, proclamation for Girl Scout Day. I see some Girl Scouts on the line, and uh, Council Member Lori Kinnear is going to read that, followed by Caitlin Smock. And I see the Girl Scouts with Brian Newberry, uh -huh. so welcome. Whereas March 12, 2021, marks the 109th anniversary of Girl Scouts of the USA the largest and most successful leadership program for girls in the world, offering girls 21st century programming in science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, the outdoors, entrepreneurship, and beyond, helping girls develop invaluable life skills and take the lead early and often. And whereas Girl Scouts of Eastern Washington, Northern Idaho, nobly serves over 3,000 girls across two great states, Idaho and Washington, and emphasizes public service, civic engagement, and fostering a sense of community in girls and champions the ambitious ambitions, cultivates the talents, and develops the skills of girls to be leaders in their own world. And whereas at a time when civics education is missing from many schools, Girl Scouts introduced new K-12 through civics badges to bring girls more experiences that deepen their understanding of democracy and government, prepare them for a lifetime of civic engagement, and motivate them to be catalysts for change. And during COVID-19, Girl Scouts offers skill building, digital programming, and experiences girls can participate in safely from home as they continue their Girl Scout journeys. Now, therefore, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim March 12, 2021, as Girl Scout Day in Spokane, and applaud the Girl Scout Movement and Council of Eastern Washington and Northern Idaho for providing girls with a safe, inclusive, all-girl space where they can hone their skills and develop leadership abilities. So, Brian, you might want to, you can talk certainly, but we'd really love to hear from the girls. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councilwoman Kinnear. You can hear they're so darn excited that you are talking about them. Thank you very much. This is my Brownie troop behind me, uh, Troop 2019. Hi. But thank you very much for letting us be here tonight. It's a trifecta. Mayor Woodward, uh, President Beggs, thank you for letting me join your great council and all the great council leaders there for us. It's really a trifecta. First, okay. the, the proclamation we're excited Caitlin, about. Second, it's International Day of, of the Woman today, and we're just happy to celebrate all these great role models for my girls behind me across this great global is she park. A Girl Scout and, and third, it is our Girl Scout birthday this Friday, and so we're excited to be part of Volunteers of America, Women Helping Women, and all the great leaders of this community to celebrate. I think you all agree, Council, that we're on the same Girl Scout mission of making the world a better place. And that's what the Brownies are doing behind me. And so I'm going to turn it over to a great Girl Scout, Caitlin Smock, who is uh, graduating this year from the community school. And she's going to tell you why she's so jazzed about our Girl Scout birthday this week. But before we do, Brownies, what do we want to say to the Council? We appreciate you so much. Over to you, Girl Scout Caitlin. Hi, I'm Caitlin. I am a senior at the Community School, as Brian said. I've been a part of Girl Scouts since I was in first grade. It has been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. And it has taught me so many valuable skills, like leadership, like business skills. The cookie season is going on right now. Uh, but most importantly, for me personally, it's ignited a passion for STEM within me. I am actually currently in a building right now practicing with my robotics team. I'm part of an all-girls robotics team uh, as a part of Girl Scouts. And I wanted to come on here and just tell you how wonderful it is that today is the Day of the Girl Scouts because Girl Scouts is such an amazing organization that ignites so much in girls, whether it be an interest in entrepreneurship, leadership, STEM, the arts. It lets the girls fuel their passions in a really cool space and allows them to explore their interests, minding them. And as soon as this meeting's over, I'm going to go back to building our robot. But I just wanted to say thank you so much. Girl Scouts has given so much to me. 
Thank you so much, Caitlin and Brian and Brownies. Uh, it's really exciting to hear from you. Uh, next is a proclamation for Women Helping Women Week, and Council Member uh, Kate Burke is going to read that, and she's uh, joined by Heather Hamlin after that. Council Member Burke. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, it's an honor to read this proclamation tonight. I've done a lot of work with Heather and Women Helping Women uh, on the Priority Spokane Board and many other things in the community, so thanks for joining us. Whereas Spokane's population is approximately 51% female, ranging in age, diversity, and socioeconomic status, and whereas the women and children of Spokane are the future, with the potential to achieve the highest level of education, thrive in their careers, set and reach their goals, and then empower future generations to continue these legacies. And whereas we should strive to provide equal opportunity and support all women in our community as they tap into their unlimited uh, potential. Now, therefore, I, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim March 8th, 13th, 2021 as Women Helping Women Week in Spokane and encourage all residents to recognize, support, and celebrate the women of our community, regardless of socioeconomical status, diversity, and age. So uh, Heather, why don't you go ahead and say a few words for us? Wonderful, thank you. On behalf of the entire Women Helping Women Fund Board of Directors and staff, I would like to say thank you for the recognition of Women Helping Women Week. You know, at Women Helping Women Fund, we, um, we view ourselves as grant makers, change makers, and go-getters. We educate, we advocate, and we help our community come together to support women and children. Sure, there's a long ways to go, but we're not going to stop until we get there. And this is a week that puts us in the right direction, celebrating the wonderful, amazing women in our community and all of the contributions that they make to have Spokane be a better place. So thank you for the recognition, and we are so excited to celebrate virtually this year for the second Women Helping Women Week. Thanks, Councilmember Burke and Heather, and um, exciting times. Thank you. All right, the last uh, proclamation is for Week of the Irish. And being Irish, I've decided to take, take on the task. I had to arm wrestle Councilmember Kinnear to do it, being Scottish. <laughs> but... Uh, um, Whereas, once again, it's time to celebrate St. Patrick's Day and all that it means to the sons and daughters of the old sod, those that are Irish for a day, and whereas the city of Limerick, Ireland, has been a sister city to Spokane since 1990, showing the strong bonds of friendship between our two cities, and whereas St. Patrick's Day is also a time to celebrate our diversity and the richness of the Irish culture that blends with all other ethnic cultures to enhance the fabric of our community to make Spokane a place that is welcoming to all. And whereas due to the COVID-19 pandemic this year, the friendly sons of St. Patrick will not be hosting the 43rd annual St. Patrick's Day Parade, which is typically our harbinger of spring and one of the largest Irish events on the West Coast. Now, therefore, the Spokane City Council, on behalf of the members and residents of Spokane, do hereby proclaim the week of March 8th through March 15th, 2021, as the Week of the Irish in Spokane, and urges all citizens to join with us in safely celebrating St. Patrick's Day with their loved ones. I, Brian Begg, Spokane City Council President, do hereunto set my hand and cause the seal of the City of Spokane to be affixed this eighth day of March, 2021. Thank you. And now uh, I see Leslie Quick is uh, on the video for she's going to bring us a report from actually one of the most exciting neighborhoods in the city right now peaceful valley uh not I the best think reason so. <laughs> uh but let, tell us what's going on in peaceful valley right now and and over the last year i will and um hannah lee i think you have a presentation i don't have anything oh she has my PowerPoint presentation slides and stuff she she does not um, no, no. Let's see. Oh. Yep. Well, she's looking. If she gives me a minute, just a little bit. Nope. Why don't you give us? An, can you give us an update on the hillside? What's going on? Or is that part of your presentation? Yeah. 
Yeah, actually, Hillside's um, this year, so I'll, I'll remind you again about Town Hall next year. So in the meantime, I'll, um, what we know about it, um, I have a bounce back on my, are, are there people hearing that? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very odd. Here you go. How about now you should be good. Oh. Well, not sure what I can do about that. So <clears throat> um, Hillside is, uh, they've been, clearing a lot of the brush and debris off there and making great progress on that. There's an, uh, a nice little plateau up there now that the geotechnical engineers will be able to put some monitoring equipment down there that will be able to measure movement. And so based on the results of that, they'll be able to, to, um, to uh, figure out next steps, but it does look like the next steps will, will, probably involves some sort of geo, uh, geo block wall. And then also um, a Vista moving their poles to the other side of the street permanently. And then it's not known yet since they don't know geotechnically uh, a full picture underneath what will happen with that little, uh, that little squeeze point as far as the trail goes. And so we'll know more shortly, but it does definitely kind of jam things up a little bit. So, and, um, that's all we know so far. I actually was going to have someone come to our Peaceful Valley Neighborhood Council meeting on Wednesday, someone from the city that we were thinking we'd get updates on the project and next phase three and all that. And, and, we'll, you know, of course, now just need to pull that from that agenda and, uh, it's a big up in the air right now. Okay. Well, it looks like Hannah Lee has your cover slide up on the screen. Okay. And Hannah Lee, I'll just ask you to advance it at each time. So <clears throat> if you want to go to the next slide or do, okay. Uh, so highlights for 2020 in a year that it didn't seem like much went on as I started to put this presentation together. It was like, wow, that's, there's a lot that went on. <laughs> um, we enjoyed some great partnerships. That I'll, I'll highlight those in some pictures. Uh, talk about the water utility and swale work that's going to continue this year. Um, have a, a couple pictures of what did get finished in 2020. And then some uh, little finishing touches that will go on uh, in two, 2021. Talk about our little adjustments we made in the neighborhood for COVID and then a few things that are on our hearts and minds for this current year going forward. So next slide. So some of our great partnerships we had, once again, we love partnering with Brown's Edition. They've been such a wonderful neighbor. Uh, we did some cleanup work with Brown's Edition. We had some, uh, some of our residents go up to there and help with their, um, their Coeur d'Alene Park cleanups and their, their neighborhood cleanup. And then they also, too, reached out and came down to our uh, neighborhood and helped clean the stairs at, um, at Spruce off of Riverside. And uh, those are always uh, a troubled area for debris and stuff. So we ended up collecting a lot of trash, and that was a fun, event, a fun event to share with them. Another continued partner is the different organizations that help uh, – you know, have fun on the river and, and earn their living from the river. The rafting companies and the, and the fly fishing companies are a wonderful partner for us. The picture there in the background actually is of some of the fly fishing groups that were able to assist in an overturned kayak, you know, stopped what they were doing and, and help the person get their kayak off of the rocks and, and um, see that them helping out often with the rafters get will we'll get um, high-ended on the rocks and stuff so they they all work together really really well they've coordinated really well with using the boat launch that was uh, finalized last year as well as the new turnaround at the end of water street and the turnaround that's at the end of water street did have some of the trail work going on and swale work so that was uh available for part of the time, but uh, they're looking forward to having that full access again as well. Um, next slide. Art partnerships. We've had, we've, 
we've just been so blessed to have things come to us without even us having to ask for it or really lobby for it. The Hoop Town and Multicare Rockwood and the Spokane Arts reached out to uh, our neighborhood as well as other ones and gave us the opportunity to weigh in on what design we wanted. We were so pleased that the design that we wanted the, the most in a survey monkey they did was the one that they chose for our neighborhood. And we had some community, uh, we had some residents that were able to go to that event where they finalized which, uh, which um, artist work was going to be chosen for our neighborhood. But the artist for the, the uh, basketball court was Tiffany Patterson, did a great, great job. It turned out so beautiful. Uh, there's her painting on it. Um, she, in turn, got a little support from the neighbors where it was locked down COVID and the bathrooms, bathrooms weren't open there. So she had neighbors that were offering that if she needed anything, she could use their bathrooms or come in and get a glass of water or something like that. So um, that was that was fun to watch her in progress do the basketball hoop or a basketball court. And, and another one that came our way was the fishing weir the art installation by Sarah Thompson called Convergence. And it's really magnificent. It, uh, if you take a, a walk along the path, just as you get to this vantage point of seeing through the weir, it just connects the flow of the river. And it's almost like it's just coming right up to you, which was what the artist was so delighted to hear that that came through because that was something she was hoping for. It's really a neat installation. It's um, for it being a, a big metal sculpture. It doesn't look um, bulky or anything in the corner. It just, it looks like it's been there for a long time and that it was always meant to be there. So really happy to have that. Next slide. So ongoing project phase two turned into phase two and three. Uh, we are really disappointed at the start of the year that there was no, not going to be really any trail work. Uh, we were really bummed about that. Some of why that got delayed last year, certainly for COVID and, uh, and bids and stuff, but also part of the delay was a, for a good reason is that they were able to make an agreement with a piece of property that was going to have a little gap in the trail. Uh, Bert Small had a piece of property that went right along the river, and they were finally, after literally years of trying to get them to to um, have an agreement where we could have the trail there, they did finally secure an agreement with them. So uh, they have part of the trail built there. It's not paved yet, but it connects to swale areas. So that picture in the upper left is the swale that's right below the mudslide on Elm. That's Elm and the bottom of Maine. Um, that will continue, but they can't do too much till they make sure that they're not in the way of equipment that's going to be needed on the hillside. So that picture is taken almost from the hill, from the uh, slide area. So. Um, certainly that slide is going to impact what they can do down there. But they do have the other uh, swale at the end of Water Street that that still has a lot to do, and they'll finish that up. And then that Burt Small property, that's what you're looking at there, that's right along the river. That was just such a, a, a wonderful get to get that little connecting piece. The right-hand picture was some Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife stairs. That, that was another surprise addition to the trail project. There was a well-worn path that people would take right down to the river's edge, and so they embraced that and built out these really nice uh, stairs. They're solid. They're easy access. It's not uh, uh, ADA-compliant but it, it wasn't before. It didn't have to be. There's too much of a steep slope there. But it does make it where that little area is more secure for people to access down to the river, as well as minimizing some of the, the um, homeless camps that would have access to that little area as well. 
And then finally, the parking lot got mostly done. Uh, it's great to see it so well used. Uh, they were able to bump out the west boundary of it and add some more parking space. And so it's orderly. It's a painted parking lot. So it's, it, it just fills up with cars every weekend to minimize the ones that have to be on uh, parking on the street. And that might end up picking up next summer. But it's been really nice to be able to pull in there pretty much any time and find a parking uh, parking spot and see people you know, taking their stroller out of their car with their kids and putting the dog on the leash and, and uh, getting easy access to the river. And then another benefit to that has been the light pole, I think, has minimized some of the overnight um, activity there. It used to be that you would always see, you know, a couple few cars there, even at, you know, the wee hours of pulling into a dark parking lot at 12.30 at night or something, um, it, it always felt unsafe. But with that lighted area now, you actually go through the parking lot or go by the parking lot now, and it's empty. It's, it's really minimized the activity that way for overnight camping and, and um, sketchy meetups. So next slide. Everybody had some adjusting to the pandemic for sure, um, but we rolled with it. We fortunately had enough people that were doing Zoom. Um, I already had a Zoom account for my work, so we just kind of kept rolling along as best we could. It certainly did impact participation. So we did decide as an executive committee to put a hold on people losing their voting rights, their voting privileges, if they were... Um, if they had it before the pandemic and they weren't able to attend meetings or they missed what normally is in our bylaws of if you miss six in a row, then you won't, uh, then you'll lose your voting rights. But we decided to put a pause on that and, and pick that up back up when it's appropriate. But we still maintain part, uh, part, enough participation to have quorums when we needed a vote on something. Um, you know, Jan Liu there in the middle has always been such a great, uh, a great leader in the neighborhood. And Bill Foreman was our secretary treasurer. Jacoby there does such an awesome job and he is so delightful to work with. And that was a great picture of him on one of our recorded meetings. Um, as well as kind of keeping business going. Nick at Parks has done a presentation about the zip line and, and uh, we have a new uh, neighborhood Council Liaison, Gabby Ryan there. And she, we really look forward to working with her. Had some fun presentations. Fish and Wildlife came and uh, did a presentation on critter control and how to, what you can do to kind of minimize the raccoons and skunks and turkeys and wildlife that can do some damage to your property. So uh, they gave us some great resources. And, and then we also really appreciate uh, Councilwoman Wilkerson participating in our meetings and adding those to her uh, other activities and joining in whenever she can. So, next slide. And then finally, looking forward, I'm um, happy to take some questions about the, the, the trail work and what, I, what we do know and what we don't know. That top picture is a picture of the slide area. You know, that's... Um, <laughs> It's just something to see for, you know, knowing what it was and seeing all that dirt dumped there, uh, kind of securing up that rock wall that was starting to, to uh, bust open at the seams. So um, they've got that road closed right now, working on it. There's a little bit of a pathway or a little bit of an opening that you can go through sometimes. Um, now that they're starting to work on the trail, it will probably be more permanently um, all the way closed. But um, it's, the mountainside has been secured enough to not worry about trees coming down on a car or you know, the hillside coming down the rest of the way. And um, so we'll, they're gonna start the trail back up again. They actually started work today, Lou Rivier. Uh, Lou Rivier is um, continuing to work on that and they're starting at the swale at, end of Water Street, and then we're waiting to hear, 
the hillside is kind of made it where we don't, you know, they don't know where they can start work around that. There's a retaining wall to put up more, uh, more in the middle of Peaceful Valley. Um, that's kind of right in front of my area. So a retaining wall to go up. You're going to be digging up the road, but do you dig up the road while you're waiting to see what's going to happen with that little dirt pile there? So we'll, we're, we're rolling with it, but we, uh, everyone's confident that they'll be able to continue and finish the trail work as well as the work that they're going to do on Wilson Street at the, at the back side of, of um, Peaceful Valley. Uh, and then with the delay in COVID, we had some unused, well, we had our, uh, a partnership with Brown's Edition where they shared their $10,000 community development block grant funds from 2019 that were supposed to be spent by June of 2020 and of course, everything got paused. And we do have the assurances from Garrett and Nick, uh, Nick and Parks that they will allow those to be spent later. Usually there's a hard deadline. So we still are waiting to see how we can finalize spending those community uh, development funds. And that, that was um, committed towards trail amenities. And so now with the trail kind of getting postponed, we're thinking that that might have been a blessing that now we can stretch out that 20,000 of trail amenities over the whole thing instead of trying to maybe crowd in $20,000 worth of trail amenities um, when only half the trail was done. So we're going to um, continue to work with parks on that. Is there some questions I can answer about Peaceful Valley? A note, any council members have questions or comments? Feels like a comprehensive report, Leslie, and glad you are safe down there and it's getting to be All so right. beautiful. Well, we should do miss seeing you down there. Yep, yep. All right. Thank you so much for your and time. And Betsy, thank you for going on the walk with our neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. I'll be back. <laughs> yep. All right. All right. Thank you, Leslie. Give our best. Thank you, Hallie, for your help. To all your neighbors. Yep. Okay. I will. All right. I will. See ya. Thank you all. Have a wonderful week. Okay. All right. That brings us to our legislative agenda. And I had a request since briefing session uh, for a motion to defer our first special budget ordinance, 36016, for one week. They need some more time to prepare. So I'm looking for a motion. Did so moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed, nay? Abstentions? All right, that's deferred for a week. On my sign-up for community member testimony, there were a few people that said they wanted to testify about that. So I'm just going to ask you to go to... No. No? That's the... SBO. I've removed it from the sign up sheet. All right. The, the sign ups are just for. Okay. You look at that. Anyway, if you were signed up for that, you can talk about it in open form. So, because on my, on my sheet it says that there are yeses for that. But, um. I thought you were moving the resolution, not the first SBO. No, it's the SBO. But Sorry. that's all right. So either uh, there's three people who might have signed up. It's uh, unclear to us. Alita Gowan, Stephen Tipke, and Corey Tews. But you might have been signing up for um, open forum at the end. But we'll be getting to that very quickly. So, But if you were really wanting to talk about that, I will permit you to do that when we get to open forum. But let's get to the next ordinance. Did you want to... Do the appointments first. Oh, I didn't see the appointments. Oh, the I'm sorry. Human yep. Rights Commission? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Appointment of Lorna Hernandez Jarvis at an at-large position on the Spokane Human Rights Commission for remainder of term to expire December 31, 2022, and an appointment of Anwar Peace to District 3 position on Spokane Human Rights Commission for remainder of term to expire December 31, 2022. Sorry, I would, you were, 
Yes. Let me, I'll do one thing at a time. So thank you for reading that. And uh, both of these individuals already serve on the commission. And um, all those in favor of continuing their service indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? All right. Any abstentions? All right. Thank you both for your service. You bring a lot to that board. And I'm informed that I was mistaken about that ordinance. We have both an ordinance 16 and a resolution 16, and it's the resolution 16 that needs to change. So I'm going to have to ask for a reversal to reinstate ordinance number 36016 to tonight's agenda. Is there a motion to do that? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? All right. We'll get back to that. So now, go ahead and read Ordinance 36016. Okay. Ordinances amending Ordinance Number C 35971 passed by the City Council December 14, 2020, and entitled an ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2021, making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2021, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage, and declaring an emergency and appropriating funds in. Ordinance C-36016, Criminal Justice Fund from Unappropriated Reserves, $55,100 to interfund IT expense, same amount. An Information Technology Fund from Other Internal Service Changes, $55,100 to various accounts, same amount. This action budgets for the creation of a new position for long-term support of the E-Series Criminal Justice Solution. All right, I do have two people signed up if they really want to testify on this. So I will call out your name, Stephen Tipke, if you want to hit star three. And if, if you want to testify about anything, Mr. Tipke, go ahead and do that. All right. Is, uh, Stephen Tipke, if you want to. Hello, I'm here. Oh. And are you here? Hello? To, yes. And are you here to testify about the special budget ordinance or something else? Uh, yes, I'm speaking on behalf of getting a cold case unit uh, reopened okay. in Spokane. That's, all right, so that's going to be a little bit later. That's what I, I thought, okay. perhaps. So thank you for uh, hitting star three, but we'll get back to you sh shortly. And then similar might be the same situation, but you're technically signed up for this one. Corey Twos, T-E-W-S, if you're there, if you want to hit star three. All right. Corey, are you... Testifying about cold cases or this budget ordinance? Yes, I'm also for the cold case files, okay. and, and I mistakenly did that wrong, so I'll just wait my turn. No no worries at all. We'll get back to you. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Any council commentary about the special budget ordinance, adding an IT uh, position to help administer all this new coordinated technology in our criminal justice system? All right. Not seeing any. Um, let's start with a roll call. We'll start with Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President and I. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes six to zero. If you could. Read the next ordinance. Okay. Ordinance C-36017, Fire EMS Fund from Washington State Department of Ecology, $100,000 to various accounts, same amount. This action budgets an amendment to a Department of Ecology grant for hazmat vehicles and equipment. We don't have any public comment on that. Um, is there any council commentary? All right. Hearing and seeing none, we'll have a roll call. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President and I, Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes six to zero. Next ordinance. 
Ordinance C-36018, Asset Management Capital Fund from Undesignated Reserves, $1,300,000 to operating transfer to Arterial Street, same amount. An Arterial Street Fund from operating transfer in from Asset Management, $1,300,000 to various accounts, same amount. This action budgets to expend the proceeds from the sale of the Normandy property. All right, there's no um, community commentary on that. This is one of the last moves in the strategic reserves that we um, set up several years ago. Any council commentary on it? All right, hearing and seeing none, we'll have a roll call. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I, Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. Passes six to zero. Another special budget ordinance. Ordinance C-36019, Emergency Rental Assistance Fund from Grant Revenue, $6,695,536.90 to contractual services, same amount. This action creates a fund to deposit in contract funds, re contract funds received from the Department of Treasury for emergency rental assistance. All right, no community commentary. And again, this just sets up the fund for the federal COVID relief for rental assistance passed in December of last year to come to us. I believe we have requests for proposals out on the street for organizations to distribute this to uh, community members living in the city, but we don't have the details on when that's going to start or how it's uh, going to be distributed yet. But any council commentary? Seeing and hearing none, we have a roll call. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President and I, Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes six to zero. Last special special budget ordinance. Ordinance C-36020, General Fund from Unappropriated Reserves, $225,713 to transfers out to Arterial Street, same amount. And New District Capital Fund from Unappropriated Reserves, $1,700,000 to transfers to Arterial Street, same amount. An Asset Management Capital Fund from Other Long-Term Debt Proceeds, $2 million to transfers to Arterial Streets. This action allows for recording loan proceeds and the transfer of funds to Arterial Streets for the construction of the East Sprague Project in the U District. All right, there's no community commentary requested on this. Any council commentary? Hearing and seeing none, we'll have a roll call. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes six to zero, which gets us to the resolution that was requested to be deferred for one week, 2021-0016. And that is to support the issuance of city bonds uh, for, again, the Sprague Phase Two project. And apparently we need a little more language um, to be changed in that, so they've requested that. Be delayed for a week. Is there a motion to defer for a week? So moved. Is there a second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Any uh, council commentary? Well, any discussion about deferring for a week? Hearing and seeing none. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? Okay. That is deferred for a week. Next resolution. Resolution 2021-17, declaring Dresser Rand Company, Seattle, Washington, a sole source provider and authorizing the city to enter into a value blanket order for the purchase of parts necessary for the condensing steam turbine generator drive package, serial number D0823 for a two-year period, approximately $1,800,000 without public bidding. All right. There's no public commentary requested. Any council commentary? Hearing and seeing them, we'll have a roll call. Councilmember Stratton. 
Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Sinai. Council Member Burt. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. That passes six to zero. Next resolution. Resolution 2021-18, approving settlement of a civil claim against the City of Spokane brought by Stephen Gilbert. There's no community comment requested on this. Any council commentary? All right, we'll have a roll call. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President and I. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes six to zero. There's no first reading ordinances, so that brings us to open forum. And the people I have signed up, I'll read uh, in the order that I believe they'll be testifying if they're here. If by chance you're watching and not on your phone, please go to the phone because we have a pretty significant video delay. Uh, the people that I have in order are Diana Gulick, Sandra Brewer, Ray Kreitz, Mary Knowlton, Alita Gowan, Stephen Tipke, Corey Tews. So again, you'll have up to three minutes uh, to share with us your thoughts. Please address them to me, the council president. Um, and please no disparaging or disruptive uh, remarks so that everybody has a fair chance. And I won't remind you when you're near the end of your time. I'll just tell you when your time's up and ask you to finish that last sentence. So with that, if Diana, uh, if you're there, if you want to hit star three and raise your hand. All right, Diana, go ahead and introduce yourself. You have up to three minutes. Okay, hi, Council President. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Diana Gulick, and I'm a licensed mental health therapist and small business owner in Spokane. I want to first say thank you for your compassion and attention to the possibility of funding a cold case unit in Spokane. I'm excited about the progress being made and conversations that are being had to discuss this possibility. Per my last testimony, I know you've heard about the murder of my brother when he was just 13 years old. I have a unique experience as I am affected by this violent crime personally, but have also identified a specialty of trauma in my private practice. I did not set out to become a therapist who specializes in trauma, but found myself working in a trauma response center as my first job out of graduate school. I was also assigned to work for a grant that would provide case management and outpatient mental health for men, women, and children who experienced sexual assault and did not. We, Diana, we've lost you. I don't know if you're still there. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you again. We lost you for a minute, for a second, I should say. Okay. Um, I have worked with countless people who have experienced sexual assault and seen firsthand how experiences like this dramatically change lives forever. Just as I experienced as a child uh, my trauma, people's sense of safety is often taken from them when they experience sexual assault or have a loved one who is murdered. It can often feel like a second victimization when navigating the legal system. My hope is that adding a cold case unit to Spokane's police department will provide justice and closure to so many people who have suffered for years. I am grateful that the police department has collected evidence that can now be used to catch some of these criminals. The trauma that occurs when one experiences these crimes is often forgotten by others as time passes. For those of us who have experienced these crimes, it will be a vivid memory that serves as a marker in our lives who I was before my brother Russell was murdered and who I am after. Through the cold cases of Spokane Facebook group, which has grown to over 500 members, I've connected with several individuals and families who are in various stages of healing. This type of trauma is often generational and has the impact. Um, many of my parenting decisions are shaded with the trauma that I've experienced, as well as the, the stories of sexual assault that I've heard over the years. 
I appreciate your time and will continue to advocate in any way I can to help bring justice to the people and families impacted by unsolved homicides and sexual assaults. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And if you want to go ahead and hit star three, that will lower your hand. And then Sandra Brewer, if you'd like to hit star three. And Sandra will be followed by Ray Kreitz. If you're there, Sandy, not seeing you. All right. Uh, Ray Kreitz, if you could raise your hand by hitting star three. All right. Ray, go ahead and introduce yourself. You have up to three minutes. Thank you, for, thank you, Council President, for allowing me the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Ray Kreitz, and I've lived in the Spokane area since the 1970s. In that time, Spokane has seen its fair share of big, big criminal cases, from Kevin Coe to Robert Yates and, and many more. Thankfully, many of those cases have been solved thanks to the diligence of investigators and the tenacity of the families that cannot, that cannot and will not let their loved ones go without justice. Unfortunately, some cases don't get solved quickly, and the trail of evidence goes cold. Like the cases of David Willoughby and Lori Partridge, Julie Weflin, Kathy Avis, Debbie Finnern, and Russell Evans, just to name a few. These cases have gone cold, but their families are still holding out for justice. They're still waiting for a phone call from a detective telling them they're one step closer to finding the answers. <clears throat> just like they did for the family of Marcy Bellitz not long ago. Luckily for Marcy's family, the evidence finally came, even though it only took 35 years. That's because evidence doesn't magically appear in the third act of a one-hour crime show. It can take years, sometimes decades, even longer if there's no one working the case or no investigator tracking down leads and putting in the required legwork it takes to connect the dots. If no one's searching for answers, that no one's family gets that call. Crimes don't just solve themselves, and that's why we need a dedicated cold case unit in Spokane, because it takes dedicated, tenacious detectives to find those answers. If they can't find them if they aren't given the chance, it's going to take more. It's going to take a commitment from the city of Spokane, because every family deserves answers, and every victim deserves justice. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Mary Knowlton, if you want to hit star three. And Mary will be followed by Alita Gowan. All right. Mary, go ahead and introduce yourself. You have up to three minutes. Council President, thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight. My name is Mary Knowlton, and I've lived in Spokane for the majority of my life. When I found out that Spokane does not have a dedicated cold case unit, I was shocked. I guess I took it for granted that a city this size would have one. As a concerned citizen, I am compelled to speak on this matter. As members of the community, I believe we owe it to one another to have our cold cases being worked for two main reasons. First, if we value the lives of those who live here, we should continue to work on solved cases. What does it say about the worth of our community members when we don't? And what does it say to those who commit violent crimes against us? That brings me to my second point. Working cold cases can help identify and remove violent offenders from our streets, helping to decrease the number of future violent crimes. I cannot imagine what it would be like to have a loved one murdered with not only no resolution to the case, but no one even working on solving it. I cannot imagine a rape victim ever feeling safe with their attacker unidentified and out on the street. The points I've made are not original, but they are important. As Spokane continues to grow, I think it is essential for the city to have a dedicated cold case unit for our safety now and in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next, if Alita Gowan would like to hit star three, and after Alita, Stephen Tipke. All right. Alita, go ahead and introduce yourself. You have up to three minutes. 
Good evening, Council President. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Alita Gallen, and I live in Brown's Edition here in Spokane. I am here today representing Just Housing, a group of master social work students at Eastern Washington University. We know that when an earthquake happens near the ocean floor, water initially recedes, creating a false sense of security before returning as a tsunami. A year ago, COVID-19 hit all of us like an earthquake. While current eviction moratoriums have kept eviction rates from surging, they will come flooding in once those moratoriums expire. And when they do, certain people and communities here in Spokane are going to bear the brunt of the damage from these eviction floodwaters. Research shows that racial minorities and people living below the poverty line are unfairly affected by eviction. According to Spokane Community Against Racism, 70% of black and brown Spokane residents are renters. Ben Stuckert with Spokane Low Income Housing Consortium is estimating that 2,500 low income Spokane residents are at risk of eviction when the moratorium is lifted. The zone recently conducted a survey of Northeast Spokane families, some of whom live in the zip code with the highest poverty rate in the state, and found that 74% of them are worried about losing their housing. Northeast Spokane includes 68% of Spokane students of color and 20% of Spokane's English language learner population. This potential tsunami of evictions will have severe and long lasting effects on these communities. Evictions are associated with a host of negative health and social outcomes, and a wave of evictions could also destabilize the low income housing market. Preventing evictions is in the best interest of everyone, and while it will save money in the long run, it will require substantial funding right now. But this issue isn't just about the amount of funding that is needed. It is also, to quote from Daniel Walters in the Inlander, and I quote, over who gets help and how, end of quote. We are calling on you to do two things, to continue to prioritize rental assistance and receiving any future federal COVID relief money, and to keep Spokane's marginalized communities in mind as you allocate these funds offering them additional support and resources to ensure they can access the rental assistance they may need. Thank you for all that you have already done to support the residents of Spokane through this challenging pandemic time, and thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. All right, Mr. Tipke, if you would like to hit star three. All right, go ahead and introduce yourself. You have up to three Hello. minutes. Yeah. Hello, my name is Stephen Tipke. Um, I want to take a moment to thank you guys for the moment to speak about the cold case unit and what it would mean to our family. Um, I'm here to talk about my brother-in-law. His name is Billy Floyd. He was murdered on August 15, 2009, when he was stabbed in the chest and pronounced dead before he got to the hospital. We feel like the detectives at the time back then even though we're very busy, did not at all do the best job that they could do, which is a big reason why it's still unsolved today. Since the day Billy died, his parents, Bill and Angela Floyd, sisters Heather, Stephanie, and nieces and nephew, and me, his brother-in-law, have not been able to live with true happiness or peace in our lives, and have experienced the most unimaginable worst pain we've ever felt. Even though solving his murder would not bring Billy back or make us totally satisfied, but it would give some kind of peace and closure more importantly, justice for Billy. The pain we all feel is so much worse knowing that the person who took Billy away from us and ended his life at only 22 years old is not behind bars or paying for the hurtful and life-changing crime that he did and caused. We appreciate the chance to talk right now and to be heard. <laughs> and uh, opening up a cold case unit would truly be a wish come true, not only for our family, but I'm sure for all the families of unsolved murder victims. We have total faith and believe in the law enforcement here in our great city of Spokane. And Billy and all the other unsolved murder victims all deserve another chance for a more thorough investigation, as it would truly change a lot of lives. On behalf of Billy Floyd and our whole family, we appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we have one more speaker, Corey Tews. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Go ahead and hit star three. All right, go, go ahead and introduce yourself, and you have up to three minutes. 
Hi, good evening. My name is Corey Tews. Thank you, Council President, for the opportunity to let me speak. I reside in Indian Trails in Spokane. I'm a transplant. I've been here for 20 years, and I love the area. I, in fact, was also found that didn't have a defined cold case file unit. Um, in my past, I've worked with several police departments in a non-traditional type of role when it comes to missing or murdered um, people. Um, there was an example I worked on the Elizabeth Smart case in, in Utah. Um, that being said, in honor of Women's Week, I would like to use their theme and say, let's inspire some movement. Um, these loved ones that are left behind, they need closure. They need answers. They have loved ones that they lost. They haunt their dreams, their daily existence. Can you imagine not knowing what happened to your family member or your friend, your, your brother, your sister, your mom? Why did this happen to them? And who did these crimes, these heinous crimes to them? Wouldn't you want to make sure that no other family ever has to feel this? These victims need a voice. They don't deserve to be forgotten. Please consider getting our inundated investigators more help, fresh eyes, even in non-traditional ways, per se. I guess that's all I have to say this evening. Um, I appreciate you listening and hope that you consider strongly um, developing a new program and getting maybe some outside help for our inundated police workers. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for sharing your heartbreaking stories. Um, we did get some news just recently that we have gotten some grant funding for uh, clearing up cold sexual assault cases. And I we know can't hear you, Council President. Thank you, Councilmember Burke. Yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for their testimony this evening uh, and sharing their heartbreaks. Um, and I did want to just say in response generally that uh, we did get some good news that we got some more money for uh, uh, solving cold sexual assault cases. And I know that many of the people testifying and um, council members have been talking with the police about some of the vacant positions that we have that we could fund a cold case um, unit from those without really any extra cost. So it's more of a matter of just getting people hired into those positions, it seems like. So thanks for the attention and the spotlight that you bring to that. Uh, I should just check one more time and see if Sandy Brewer is there. Sandy, if you're there, star three. Maybe. Are you there, Sandy? Hello, who's this? Hello, this is Sandy Brewer. All right, Sandy, Brian Bags here. Uh, we missed you before, but we will give you up to three minutes. So if you want to introduce yourself and, uh, and talk to us, what's on your mind? Thank you so much. Thank you, Council President. I did want to talk regarding the cold case unit. Uh, I was the first patrol officer in the city of Spokane. And after that, I formed an investigations company and during my 30 plus years working in this company, I've worked with several families uh, who have came to me because the police did not have the uh, people that they needed or the resources uh, to work on these cold cases. Uh, back in the early 90s, I was subcontracted out with the coroner's office. So myself and the police department and two prosecutors were assigned to working on the Russ Evans homicide at that time. And I know just from that experience uh, how much time that it does take and knowing how busy the police department is now that a cold case unit would be phenomenal. And I know there are several um, council members that have been very helpful in this, which I really appreciate. I am personally working with two or three cold case victims' families right now, uh, trying to bring some closure, but obviously we need some help for the, with the police department. There are records and other things that we can't access. We have uh, thought of forming a nonprofit uh, volunteer group of detectives and investigators that have retired, and I'm doing this voluntarily now I am retired. So uh, to help with this in case, you know, that 
we can't get enough um, individuals for the cold case unit and hopefully they could cooperate the police department with if they need some outside help with some of us that want to do nonprofit work for this issue. Um, of course, I've seen all of the devastation it has caused with people from the time I was on the department to all the investigations I've done and for the families. And the closure is uh, extremely important. Uh, it's, I, I, I can't tell you, it's, it's pretty sad to see. Um, and for me myself to not be able to um, fully access enough information because there is evidence that does need to be followed up on. So it would be wonderful if uh, this cold case unit gets formed. And then if they need outside help, there are plenty of us that will volunteer our time to work on these cases. All right. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for sharing with us tonight. And that brings us to the end of our meeting. Uh, we will have our next council meeting is our Thursday study session at 11 a.m. And then we'll be back here next Monday afternoon at 1.15, 3.30, and 6 o'clock legislative session. Um, with that, please take care of yourself and take care of someone else if you can. We are adjourned. Go Zags!